An orchestra is so powerful, and it's like it's like bringing a lion out with with a piece of meat to seduce them to bring themselves out, knowing at at full well that they can either just say no, thank you, or you know they can eat you alive. Whether you're working with students or seasoned professionals, as long as you really convey to them that you truly deeply respect them, I have found that they're willing to go just about anywhere with you. Let's see if we can get the first note together, that'd be great. Ready? Yeah. Exactly. from the San Diego Chamber Orchestra saying that they were looking for a new music director, would I be interested? Well, I, I came and I, and I conducted a concert and so they came to me and said, look, we want to stop the search right now. We think you're the right person at this point and would you take the job? And I, and I said yes. One of the first things I did is I called all of the musicians together. We sat in a big room together and I said, before we, we launch on this, this is my plan and I had a very detailed plan. I, I, I put out, this is the state of our industry, because musicians tend to live a somewhat sheltered life. They don't know always what's going outside of the metropolitan area in terms of other orchestras. And I said, this is failing here, and this orchestra is in debt here, and this is where the industry is moving, this is where the internet is taking us, and we cannot just simply survive with putting the tuxedo on and simply performing. And if you give me your hearts and we play with more energy and more enthusiasm, and more creativity, I believe they will come. But it will take a great amount of trust on your part. Playing in an orchestra is very difficult. You are m making music on such a high and individualized level, and yet you have to do it on a, on a, on a uh, in concert with so many other people, and you're listening and you're watching. Every child dreams of becoming a Yasha Heifetz or Itzhak Perlman. Someone in a very innocent way, drops that into their brain. Practice hard because you will be famous. Not a lot of people, your music teachers say, practice hard so you'll get a job in an orchestra. It's not their inherent dream. So, you know, my job, I believe, is to awaken that child inside of them, that, that, that hope, that aspiration, that I do matter. The way that I talk to the musicians is very collegial. If you come to the rehearsals, you'll see dialogue back and forth. It's not, you know, the word of God going to the musicians. If they have ideas, I'm very welcome to it. It is more like a chamber music situation where, you know, something you would have in a string quartet, where there's a lot of give and take and uh, a lot of uh, communication between, with, between the players, as opposed to just looking at the conductor and, and, and following him. We, we sort of feed from each other. Uh, musically and emotionally and uh, 
So the end product is very different than what I've been doing uh, until uh, Zhang Ho took over. fabulous chemistry that is so different from a large orchestra. In the smaller orchestra, your skills at virtuosity are rewarded. Zheng Ho takes us through the paces so we know exactly what we're all doing at any particular time. I know the violin's part, I'm listening for the trumpet's part, I'm um, watching what the conductor does, you know, and I know when um, I know that I can trust him when I watch him and take my eyes off the music, and um, that he and I will be in the same, you know, be going in the same direction. We're really asked to take risks as performers, as if we were playing for our own pleasure in our living room. Music is dead when it's sitting on the shelf and it's not played, but as soon as it's on the stand, the musicians are preparing it and we perform it, it begets life. My communication with my fellow trumpet player Frank Glass and, and the principal horn player and or somebody in the bassoon section or a violinist, that communication is very obvious in this orchestra. We spend a lot of time honing that nonverbal skill of communication. Jung Ho facilitates that kind of performance. It truly is like playing in a trio or quartet situation with maybe 20 more members in it. I've been in the orchestra, I think, going on six years, I want to say, and uh, John Wilds is the one that brought me in the orchestra. He, he's the principal trumpet player, and I've known John for 20-something years, and one of my favorite trumpet players in the world, and so uh, it's been phenomenal playing in this orchestra. Just, I mean, just alone being with him just makes it all worthwhile. A trumpet player here in town, Tim Brandt, he was one of the top players here in town, and he was into cycling, and one day he said, hey, why don't you come ride a bike with me? And I think I was 21, and I said, sure. And I just fell in love with it immediately. So I, uh, I went and bought a really nice bike and, and started getting into it. I uh, was rooming with, a, with one of the best racers in town, and so he got me into racing. So I really fell in love with the sport, and I noticed there was such a connection between bicycle racing in the discipline of actually the technical aspect of riding a bike, like playing the trumpet, and the team play, interplay that it takes to race, like playing a, a, a symphony with an orchestra and racing bicycles with a team. The same, I guess, level of communication that takes place playing music happens during a race. So it was interesting that because I had so much experience as a musician, bringing that into the cycling was really easy. The best part about being a musician and being a cyclist and what really makes them connected to me is the camaraderie. You know, you come to work, you see your friends. You're making music, you love what you do, that's great. But it's the, it's the people that make it great. And it's incredible that how we can all come together and do 
one thing and, and enjoy it so much and exchange ideas. And I think that music does that and sports do that, especially cycling for some reason. I can't tell you how many times where I had finished playing trumpet at work and I'm driving home thinking, how does life get any better than this? I love what I do. That was a tough ride. <laughs> For all of that musicality, all that joy that I have with the musicians, I would have to say that 90% of my job is administrative. Whereas, maybe 50 years ago, an average conductor it would be 90% musical. Today, um, a conductor has to be fiscally responsible. And I don't think I'm alone in that so much, but I, I know that I am more involved in, in the details of, of from marketing and budgeting and and, s and the staffing, and the administration, and how the orchestras run, because I think I've taken more of a cue from the business world. I, I look to people like Herb Keller with Southwest Airlines, or I look to Steve Jobs with Apple Computer, because uh, I, 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 more than ever, um, I think there has to be a uniformity of vision. And Masayo's mother speaks zero English. Mm -hmm. Zero. <laughs> and she's, she bowed last night she 27 knows the word times. No. Nice. <laughs> So, and, and her son is three, or no, two. Messiah's son? Yeah, his name is Aww. Ray, R-E-I. So all night we're saying, sayonara, sayonara. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing this, doing this. <laughs> So sweet. You know, you a smile, yeah. regardless of the language. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so I've I seen a lot of other orchestras where you walk into the administration <laughs> building and it's like work, walking into a factory. Very Orwellian. Let's panic. Let's look, look at these numbers. We've got to get these numbers up and blah, 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 blah. And, 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 you know, yelling and, and, and fear. And I, 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 it was such a dichotomy because when people come and, and you see this beautiful orchestra on stage and playing, you know, beautiful music and you just think that they go home and they're still in their tuxedos going to bed, you know, that behind the scenes, it is a really tough, tough business. And I, I always thought it was so strange. It's like it's like walking into you know behind the backstage of Disneyland and seeing Mickey take off his head and pick up a cigarette, even though they don't do that there. But you know what I mean? It's kind of oh, shocking. And and I, I swore to myself that I wanted to be part of an organization that if we're about love on stage, it had to be about love and respect backstage as well. And and we had to communicate that through our outward face and our inward face. So I've had a lot of fun, and I have to say, with the San Diego Chamber Orchestra in particular, today, right now, uh, I believe we have a dream team. Okay, here we go. So really, it comes down to I'm going to have to do this. Lord. Oh, okay. <laughs> this oh, that, that was, was just so cool. cool. That's our new song. Look at this. Is How this is this right? All over? Yeah. And we will, yeah. this yeah. will go I mean, out yeah, on totally. the sidewalk for the cars to see it with every venue. Yeah. Okay. I thought about one day, it's kind of like a dorm room around here sometimes. Oh, what do you think, Jono? Cool. Oh, well, well. <laughs> There's work time and then we get friendly and we just start chatting and then we'll make a pot of coffee and but we all put in very long hours and we all do we all do the work of departments. And so in in a symphony, my department would probably have four or five people in it. In Erin's department, she'd probably have, well, four or five or six people. And so uh, we're very concentrated here. I realized that the orchestra is Jung Ho Pak, which is just amazing. And then Tyler I knew from mainly Mozart. And Erin, she brings in the concert experience. Judith Anderson, of course, ran the Performing Arts League for a long time. And Beverly, of course, is this IBM marketing genius. So it's this great little kind of a pickup orchestra, even in the office. I oversee the orchestra librarian and the orchestra personnel manager. So month, two months out, we start ordering all the music, arranging all the players. And then the first rehearsal, I arrive about 90 minutes early and I put out all the chairs and all the music stands and I prepare the hall and I try and have that ready about a half an hour before performance or rehearsal begins. And then tomorrow we start at the church and uh, it begins early in the morning trying to get the church ready for the concert and the rehearsal. It's just a great resource position. I'm a music fan and I know when I go see a concert, I want to be 
I want to tell whoever is in charge what I want and I and I want it. And so when someone calls and says, I want to be sitting here, I want my sight line like this, I want to be, I want to see the soloist, I want this, I want that, that's my job to make sure that they get everything they want, if it's possible. Here you go, there's two tickets there, and let's just like stay in the back for you. Welcome. I go to concerts about once a week, depending, I mean, in all genres, and I've been treated badly and I've been treated very well. And what I think sets us apart is we have this motto from first contact to last note and um, we're tr what we're trying to do and hopefully we're succeeding at it is bring forth an experience literally from the first time they contact me to get a ticket or to ask a question from the very last note that plays at the concert, we want the entire time to be part of the experience. Good evening. Welcome to the Chamber Orchestra. Welcome. Good evening. It's not a classical music experience per se. Classical music is involved, obviously. But what it is is it's a lifestyle experience. It's so much more than just walking into a room, sitting down, hearing a Mozart symphony. In theater, it's easier. In opera, it's easier because you're up on stage emoting naturally. If you're not emoting, you're not doing your job correctly. Music has become this field of the fourth wall, especially orchestral music. It's this field where you know, we are performers, so we are going to go up on stage and we are going to simply play the notes that are on the page with no emotional resonance. Chung Ho has said, no, 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 no. We have to all engage the audience. We all have to be um, performers in the true sense of the word. Okay. And then, folks, if you don't mind holding your position, uh, the last note, she's got one very quiet note. Bye, I, I, um. And I'm sorry, if you can play that last note a little bit longer, that uh, louder, that would be great, too. Yeah, so it's very dramatic. And you can wait a little bit, too. And you don't have to come in too early on that. Right, right. Right, right. And take your time okay. before you come in as well. Okay, folks. Let's get to work on this. Thank you so much. A couple of things. Um, I love mistakes. I absolutely adore in, in rehearsals and concerts if they're made in the pursuit of of trying something daring. Of course, you know, when I, when I first started as a conductor, it was the technical ability. But now, by far, it's their heart. I would rather have a whole orchestra of mediocre musicians that play their, their hearts out than uh, a whole group of virtuosos straight out of some major conservatory who, who don't want to give to an audience. And of course, there, there are layers in between. but. I can reach more heart, more souls in an audience through, through that kind of giving orchestra than I can through a perfect orchestra.
was introduced to the orchestra by a former colleague who is a, also a former board member. And Glenn uh, invited me to a concert one evening after he learned that uh, I was a performing musician in a former vocation. And uh, I attended the concert and was, was really excited because it was something fresh, something uh, different than what you normally find in performing arts in San Diego. We're at a turning point. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary of this ensemble and is really at the point where it could become something much more than it's been and become something that's significant both to the city of San Diego and also to the county of San Diego. Zhang Ho, his vision and his idea of what it means for classical music and the musicians in the audience as far as all being, we're all part of this together, you know, the staff, the musicians, the audience, it's, it's something I've, I've personally never experienced as an audience member and I'm hoping that it resonates with the people who are coming to the concerts. The audience's experience is our final goal. The artistic element of the concert is geared towards their experience. It is not the other way around. One and two and three. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. A sotto voce you possibly can in the flutes. That'd be just fabulous. So just go to ghost tone. All right, folks. Just some house cleaning, folks. Just some house cleaning. First off, because our friend has got a cast on her foot, we're going to not come on separately this concert. So we'll come on beforehand. All right. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll join her for the top of the concert as well as the, the middle of the concert. As a reminder, we all bow together. Every single time we, we bow together, I ask you, and we all face forward, all of us face forward, and we all bow, and with a gracious, warm continent, countenance on our face. And if Jim Hope forgets, let's all agree. Yes, thank you so much. Grab me and just pull me into the audience. After the concert, the final bow, I'll come out for the second bow, we'll go into the audience and greet it, and they absolutely love that very, very much. Uh, Ching, thank you so much for the solo. Appreciate it very, very much. <laughs> And let's go eat some good Chinese food or Japanese food or whatever. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, we have, we yes, we have very exotic concerts today. I guess. Very exotic concerts. It's great. It's sort of this wonderful sampling of Asian music along with Silk Road, along with other um, influences. So there's some Mozart in here, and there's some Tchaikovsky and Tandun and all of these. We have a great volunteer usher team of about 60, maybe 60 ushers. We have three venues, and they are in charge of the patrons when it comes to welcoming them, making sure they're in the right seat, seeing if they need anything. And they're always just so wonderfully pleasant. And a lot of these folks have been with the orchestra for a long time. We ask a lot of them, and they always come through. Go ahead and hand it like it's a very this. small and intimate um, setting which provides a lot of warmth that you don't necessarily see in other arenas and I really love that and you get to know people personally because we have quite a few people who regularly visit and come back for the great music and so you get to know people on a personal level. It has a feeling of more of family than it does of a concert or an orchestra and it's beautiful and it's simplicity and warmth. It seems so simple but it was shocking the first time I saw it, is that our musicians greet the audience as they come in, welcoming them to the San Diego Chamber Orchestra, welcoming them to the concert that evening and to what they're about to experience. And that immediately breaks down the fourth wall. Hello, Hi, welcome. Welcome. Hi, 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 welcome. Hi
people outside of our industry go to classical music concerts for a different reason than I thought they did. I thought they were there to, um, you know, get the whole uh, panorama of Western art and that they wanted to, you know, be educated and to be informed, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think a certain amount of people want to do that. But I would have to say that the vast amount of people want to have an experience. I've come to this decision in my life where, where with professional orchestras that I want to program in a very accessible uh, in, in a very friendly way. And when I do contemporary music, which I do, or when I do find unusual pieces, I want it to be able to speak to them. Now, here, here's another thing, is that I don't give pre-concert talks. Even though I'm very adept at it, I, and, I, and I, I love using multimedia and things like this, I have found pre-concert talks as being kind of an open apology for what people are going to hear. However, and you're going to think that I'm being a little bit duplicitous, I speak to the audience during the program. And the real reason I speak to the audience is not necessarily to explain the piece, although I do give a little bit of context. It's for me to connect to them from a human point of view. Thank you very much, and welcome to perhaps one of the most exotic journeys we've ever presented. We're gonna take a trip down the Asian Silk Road. Now, there's lots of misconceptions about the Asian Silk Road. First off, that it exists primarily in Asia journey from um, China, Japan, Korea actually extends well into the Middle East and into Europe as well, down into Africa. And it wasn't only a road, it was by ships as well, traveling along the ocean to the eastern part of Africa. And tonight you're going to hear just a complete collection of different sounds and different kinds of music and different performers as well. Tonight's concert with the, uh, the koto and the oud you know, and the pipa. These are all unique instruments that uh, most orchestras don't utilize um, on, on a regular basis. And to present, you know, to present these, these sort of instruments in a, in a, in a program like this, uh, definitely, it's not the typical, you know, just the symphony orchestra sound. When I first joined, the orchestra was uh, uh, what we'd call more traditional, in a traditional sense, you know, a chamber orchestra. Um, but uh, with Jan Hall, he, he's, he's doing something that I've not seen before, um, uh, uh, starting with the uh, programming. Uh, for example, what we're doing this week, I mean, we have about 10 or 11 pieces on the program, and which you rarely see so many pieces on, on one program. And uh, it gives us the opportunity to play pieces that you normally don't hear in a concert situation. kind of surprised me how enjoyable it was because I never really hear those instruments or have seen them personally. You know, you hear them in the movies, you hear them in video games, but I've never actually seen them and I thought it was really quite an enjoyable experience. All of the concert music that I've heard, repertoire is basically from Europe, um, Mozart, Beethoven, Western music, but I haven't heard a variety from um, the different nations, Chinese music, Japanese music, so it's very exotic. Western music, everyone hears Western music and it's beautiful, but I believe that everyone should also recognize how other parts of the world translate their cultures through the language of music.
when people leave the halls, they're just, they're on fire, they're bubbling, they're happy, they're satisfied. Um, and it's, I just wish that we could share that with everybody. I know, um, I think it would be great if we could, um, you know, start pursuing some more multimedia avenues with YouTube and, you know, some of the internet stuff, because that's sort of where it's at now with our, our new generation. It's kind of like Major League Baseball. Local teams were very nervous about airing it. They thought that they would lose attendance, but what they have found is that people truly do get a taste of it. They, they, they want more. And so I'm following that model, and I think you're going to see us be a much more um, ubiquitous and, and media savvy organization. Pipa is first, and then we're going to have a Koto song, and then okay. Pipa, then Koto. So, okay, so we're going to go Pipa, Koto, Pipa, oh, Koto. Together, right? Have you ever done a concert like this, like this before? I, I have, and I, I always enjoy doing it, partly as an Asian American. You know, it's for me growing up in this country, I've sort of put that part of my life, you know, in a box and not really acknowledged it. But I think I'm, it's kind of a roots Alex Haley experience for me. I, I go back to Korea quite often. And I've just learned to embrace the multiculturalism <clears throat> culturalism as I think this country is. We have been off and running for the past year. We focused a lot on um, quality of marketing materials and also on media presence. Uh, there really hadn't been much media presence before uh, as it relates to the orchestra. Last year, as we uh, decided to try to build the media focus, uh, we went out, uh, I put press releases out, and last season we had 17, I think it was, TV appearances. This coming season, we're really going to focus on the internet, whether it's YouTube, our own website. Uh, we're going to be putting a lot more audio, a lot more video uh, up on our website. Uh, you'll see um, a, a lot of our performances, the audio and video will be up on the, at least pieces, a lot more content up on the website than it currently is. So that's really going to be our focus this year. Under the baton of Jung Ho Pak, Shakespeare's words Bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns never sounded so good. Fifteen years ago, if a musician like myself wanted to publicize myself worldwide, it would cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I just go make a nice video of myself, pop it on YouTube, everyone in the world sees me for free. So I mean, I think it's, it's phenomenal. And, and the fact is, it is reality, it is what we're faced with. And an orchestra like San Diego Chamber Orchestra is a perfect example of an orchestra that is doing something that I don't think anyone else in the world is doing right now. We need to be the model at this point th uh, that everyone can say, gee, we need to do that as well. Because what's good for us is good for everybody else. If someone else thrives, we thrive. So it's not really about competitive market, it's more about making it work for everybody so that the, so the world is interested in live music again. A uh, much less musicological approach was taken by Tchaikovsky. Again, we go back to the Nutcracker. And in his Dance Chinoise, which is about tea, he synthesizes and uh, imagines what Chinese music could sound like. I have decided that I want to be the people's orchestra and not appeal to the 2% of the population that perhaps loves classical music and wants to have a very pure experience.
lots of other organizations that are giving very pure experiences. And I may lose a couple of people who, who want to have a very, um, you know, kind of very pure experience that way. But my raison d'etre for myself, the reason I get up in the morning is I want to reach that other 98%. And I'm going to, I'm going to die on the podium or on my computer answering emails with that mission. I really wanted people to feel, to understand what this experience is. And I felt like if people could come to the concert just once, they would be hooked. Because anybody coming to the, to the concert, our experience is so unique in the world of classical music. It's truly making classical music relevant uh, to today's society. Getting a whole new audience, a younger audience. <laughs> We've talked about the idea that, that classical music, if we leave it where it is, it's, it's going to stagnate and die. That something has to happen differently because the crowds, which have always grown old, older, I mean, this, this whole genre of classical music has always uh, gone towards the, the older audience. But we, we ha we're finding that audience is, is thinning. As the people that grew up, say, with my generation and the rock generation, they're not listening to classical music as much as they used to, and their children are not being ex exposed to it, surely in school. So the education is a real issue, which the chamber workers are is addressing with their new program, which I think is just marvelous. But we have to educate people, and, and educate might be the wrong term, um, allow them to experience this music. We have now come to the last and the best learning experience in the whole music memory program the chance to hear all of these selections in live performance. Please help me welcome the amazing conductor of Orchestra Nova, Maestro Jung Ho Pop. Interacting with young people, whether they be musicians or just regular students, is the most important work we can do as professional musicians. Are you excited to be here? Yeah! Yeah! I'm excited too. And we're also very, very pleased to thank the teachers, the music memory teachers who actually taught all of you to get to this very, very high level of preparation. Where for without you, we would not be here today. So let's give our teachers a round of applause. It's assuring the, the future appreciation of this art form. And uh, I think we should be playing for young people, very, or encouraging young people to attend the concerts that we have. My son Gabriel, um, he's three years and seven months now. He started playing the trumpet when he's two. You want to let your water out there? Yeah. You know how to do it. Yeah, water. Remember, put the mouthpiece in your mouth, and then you open that little valve, turn the trumpet the other way so the water comes out. So, yeah, that's it. Open this big long valve down here. That's it, and blow. Bad boy. Good job, right on mom's carpet. Okay, here we go. It's the first time he put it on his face and made a sound, and he just put out this beautiful sound. And no matter what I said to him, he could just do it. Because he'd heard me play every day in the house, and my wife's a, a violist uh, who is with this orchestra. And uh, so I think he just picked it up because there's so much music in the house. Okay, should we do a little trilling? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This coming season is perhaps one of the most momentous 
times in our orchestra's history, probably since its birth, because in a lot of ways we're being reborn. Over the last three years of my tenure, we have done so many radically innovative things. We've changed the way that we look on stage, the way we behave, the way we play with much more energy and passion and drama and our connection to the audience. So we have really evolved into, I think, the next generation of what classical music can be, which is a more human, personal approach. And so we wanted to find a name that would reflect that. And we've gone through a lot of iterations. And part of the reason we felt we needed to change the name is there was great confusion with other arts organizations in San Diego. But also the word chamber was very confusing to the average person. They didn't know what a chamber was. So we came up with a brand new name called or Orchestra Nova. Orchestra Nova has a lot of different meanings. The first one is that my philosophy of these group of musicians I conduct is that they are individual stars. They are all great artists with particular talents. And so the way that we treat them, the way we present them, is that they're all individual entities. And so the word Nova represents stars. But it also represents innovation. The word Nova is embedded in innovation. And that's what not only we, what we have str uh, strived to be, but also what our future is as well. We're going to continue to be at the forefront of new ideas. And so the word Nova is uh, indicative of that as well. And we are in the Irwin M. Jacobs Hall, located on the Qualcomm campus in Sorrento Valley. It is one of the most perfectly designed halls from an audience point of view, uh, technologically, acoustically, and uh, we can't think of, of a better location for any orchestra to have. We are absolutely ecstatic and very proud to be able to call this beautiful building our new home. This is the end of our Silk Road project and we hope you enjoy it. And this is now Leila Monet. Empress of the Pagodas by Maurice Ravel. I am very surprised when people think that funding for the arts is something that can be cut whenever we're facing short budgetary times or whenever the prevailing political winds shift. The arts encompass everything it means to live at this time and everything that it means to have lived in the past. the arts because um, it kind of they're they're the uh, repository of civilization it's what survives uh, from ancient times what what really survives from most of those um, areas are not a lot of practical things but but things that people have valued paintings ideas um, music art it's what makes the difference between having a beautiful life and having just survival. People are striving for, for an ideal. They're striving for beauty in their lives, and there's not a lot of beauty because a lot of pop music, I like pop music, I really adore pop music, but a lot of pop music is very ephemeral. And they're, and they're searching for deeper meaning in their life, and, and, they're, and they're going to classical music for it.
not in the business of notes. I think some musicians think that, but we're not in the business of Mozart and Beethoven. Maybe even the audience thinks that, but we're really in the business of emotion. We're in the business of, um, of love. It's not your parents' orchestra, for sure. You know what? <laughs> <laughs>